Hello, this is Mrs. Murdoch, and this is a, um, a video of me going over um, a post-lab discussion about the potato soak lab that we did as part of the diffusion and osmosis lab. So uh, when we looked at the actual setup of the experiment, I drew these cups across the top here, and what we know is that we have, you know, we have, uh, we put solutions of increasing concentration into the cups, right? So we had zero molar sucrose here, 0 0.2 molar sucrose here, and going up and up and increasing so that the concentration of the sucrose solutions in each cup increased, just going simply from left to right. And then what we did was we immersed potato cores. I'm just going to draw one core per cup, just to make it simpler. We sliced potatoes and placed them in each cup. So what we were really trying to find out is we know that whatever, whatever concentration of sucrose is in these potatoes is, is going to be the same for all the potatoes, but we don't know what it is. There is an unknown solution of sucrose inside each potato core, and that unknown is the same the same concentration of sucrose, right, or molarity of sucrose per potato. And that's what we're doing this experiment to kind of find out. Because what we know already from doing the diffusion lab with dialysis tubing is that um, water will flow. Water will always flow um, from where it is, it is concentrated to where it is less concentrated. It flows down its gradient just like any other substance will move following the law of diffusion. We just call it osmosis. And it's the first thing to move in these types of situations. And, and here's another thing that's very important to realize, that in each of these beakers, in each of these beakers, there's not just one solution. There are two solutions. There's one solution outside the potato that the potato is soaking in, and then there's a different solution inside the potato cells, which we're trying to find out. And the water is either going to move into the potato to cause the system to reach equilibrium, or out of the potato, depending on the gradient, the sucrose solution that it's presented with. So by presenting these potatoes with some, un, you know, they have their own unknown concentration of sucrose inside them, and exposing them to these different concentrations, the water movement is going to tell us where the, the point is in these cups where the solution inside and outside are actually equal. And once we find that point, we'll know the sucrose concentration inside the potatoes. So when you guys weighed them, and then let them soak overnight, and then weighed them again, there was a change in percent mass. And we graphed that. And the graph looks like this. Oops, looks like this. And it was percent change in mass of the potato cores after soaking overnight in different sucrose molarities. OK. OK, so the change in mass for some of the potatoes, the change in mass increased. It gained mass. The, waters, the water went into the potato. And in some of them, you can see it went negative, right? These are negative numbers over here. Here's the zero point. So some of the potatoes lost mass. Water flowed out of them. So, I mean, let's just draw a picture of the potato that was in the 1.0 sucrose solution. Let's just think about that potato for a second. Here it is. And it's floating in here. And there's a ton of sucrose out here, just a ton. On a sucrose, I have all these little dots. Every little dot is a sucrose molecule. And look, it lost weight. The water left the potato. And remember, water will always flow from where it's higher to where it's lower. Or you could also think of water always flowing towards where there's more solutes to try to spread them out to equalize the concentrations on either side of the membrane. So if this potato lost water, as it did because it lost quite a lot of its percent change in mass, like almost 30% change in mass going negative, that means that whatever the molarity in there is less than 1. Okay. So going back up, uh, there was a 0.8 here, right? Still losing mass, so that the sucrose molarity must be less than 8. 
and going to like 0.6, which is probably right, heat, right, right there, still losing mass. So the concentration of sucrose in the potato has got to be less than 0.6. Probably 0.4 is like about here, so still negative, so less than 0.4. But then right here, right here, and we didn't have a cup that had that much sucrose in it, but because we have a relationship between percent change in mass and different concentrations of sucrose, right, we can see that there is a point where this relationship between percent change in mass and um, sucrose around the potato crosses the zero line, right? Above that line, above like let's say 0.26 we'll say, let's say that's about 0.26 right there. If we go and we're interpolating, that's what that means, we're interpolating, we're going from at zero, what's the sucrose solution that equals the inside of the potato? 0.26 molar, okay? At that point, according to this relationship that we've drawn, with uh, um, you know enough enough data collection that we, we feel pretty confident about it hopefully um, that's the point where the potato didn't gain mass and it didn't lose mass right so that is the sucrose concentration of the potato because the sucrose molarity of the potato because that's the point where the, where the water doesn't flow in and it doesn't flow out. Or really what's going on is it would be flowing both ways equally and in dynamic equilibrium. That would be the point where the potato was in dynamic equilibrium with its environment. Even though we didn't actually have a cup that was 0.26. If you looked at the, at the state of the potatoes that were in, um, oops, sorry. Come on, come on. In close to this cup right? So between this cup and this cup. Those potatoes uh, probably were kind of floating halfway in the water like that, you know, maybe close to in between because they were in equilibrium with their environment, right? So you didn't have a, you were pretty close right there to the actual sucrose molarity of the potato if our graph interpolation is correct. Um, so let's just go to the state of the other potatoes. These potatoes, if you notice, if you were one of those generous people that actually came in and, and um, did the final weight, those potatoes were swollen up with water and floating on the surface, right? And that's significant because those potatoes took in the water because their concentration was greater than the zero outside, right? Inside here is 0.26. That's a lot more than tap water, so the water had to go in to spread those molecules out in there. So those potatoes were floating and swollen up. These guys, you know, right about um, isotonic point, so they're kind of in between. Then more and more what you found as the potatoes lost water in these cups over here because the water flowed out, you had them all shriveled up on the bottom by this point because inside it's only 0.26 and outside it's syrupy 1.0. So another way to kind of visually show what happened in our experiment is to think of what happened to those potatoes. Floating and swollen up with water here and um, de dehydrated and sunk and shriveled up there. Okay, so now let's go down and talk about water potential because that's the other thing that I wanted you to get out of this. So water potential is the numerical measurement of the energy of water molecules in a solution measured in pressure bars. So we say that um, the total potential of water, remember that Mr. Anderson he talked about Poseidon and his pitchfork. Well, there's the symbol for water potential. The total water potential of, of water in a solution is going to be equal to, to the sum of two things. The water potential as affected by the solutes in the water, like the sucrose that we put in, and the water potential as affected by any pressure on that system. So for example, as an example thing here, what if you were told that uh, solute potential uh, was um, negative three because solute potential is almost is always going to be negative and the pressure potential uh, is um, positive five. Let's say they gave you that in a problem. So the total water potential then would be the sum of negative three and positive five. So total, total water potential would be two, positive two bars. 
because the value of the positive is greater than the value of the negative. You just put them together, just like adding integers. You remember how to do that. So that's what you would do in terms of a simple problem. Our problem is not quite as simple, however. One thing that we can do, because we had an open container at sea level, assuming one atmosphere, is assume that in our experiment, uh, pressure potential is equal to zero. We don't need to worry about pressure potential when we've got an open beaker on a table and we're soaking potatoes in it. We're not worried about pressure potential there. Um, we would only be worried about it if we were, you know, maybe on top of Mount Everest, or if we were way down deep in the ocean, or if we were um, you know, tapping into the insides of plant cells where there is something called turgor pressure. But that's not true here, so we're just going to move on. Um, so solute potential is calculated um, by um, negative I C R T. Okay. And uh, what we're doing with that is you start off with negative, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so calculating that, you use the formula that we used in class. Your C value is the sucrose molarity, which is 0 0.26. Your R value is right off the formula sheet, which is very simply 0 0.0831. You just plug and chug that. Um, the I is the ionization constant. Since we're dealing with sucrose, that's just going to be um, 1, because sucrose doesn't dissociate. Uh, temperature is, th our temperature in the room was about 26 degrees Celsius. If you add it to 273, you get um, Oh dear, <laughs> Mrs. Murdoch is terrible at this. 299 degrees Kelvin, there we go. Okay, so if you plug on chug all of that together, which is not difficult, you guys know how to do that, um, you would eventually come with a with solute potential of about negative 6.6 .6 bars. And that would be the water potential um, of the inside of the potato. So, so you get the concentration of the sucrose, which is your C value, by interpolating on the graph. And then you have to plug it into a, an equation to get your actual water potential of the potato. Okay. All right, so that is all I was going to say, and I hope that's helpful.